It might be hard to believe, but this invasion right here was not the worst invasion angle the WCW was involved in. I know, crazy. WCW had a weird history of cross promotion throughout the 90s, but the one we're going to look at today was booked like a typical wrestling invasion where superstars would invade their competitors shows and whatnot. Only one big problem though, the other company involved in this storyline wasn't a wrestling organisation. In the year 2000, an invasion started where WCW went up against Battledome, which to my understanding was a gladiators knockoff that lasted only two seasons. And trust me, by the time this video ends, you'll be thinking that WCW vs WWF was a masterpiece in comparison to this nonsense right here. This WCW vs Battledome thing is a total mess and because Battledome tape shows well in advance, while WCW produced live TV on Monday, Monday nights, there were some serious continuity problems with both shows telling different stories. World Championship Wrestling at the best of times struggled with continuity when just booking Nitro and Thunder every week, so the mere thought of WCW trying to streamline angles taped for another show well in advance into their already messy schedule sounded like a really bad idea. Let's see how this all played out on TV and you'll see what I mean. This is WCW vs Battledome. So, I'm gonna come clean, I've never seen an episode of Battledome until a few days prior to scripting this video, and I thought I'd really need to learn more about the show before trying to speak about it. I want you guys to meet Nick or Rebel Light as he's known on YouTube, a guy who helps me out with some wrestling bios videos and a guy who really helped in maintaining the upload schedule on the channel. In short, a dude who saved my ass multiple times. I said to Nick, hey I really want to cover this bottle dome thing for Blunder but I don't know anything about it, and Nick was like, yeah I remember that show. So I thought why not bring Nick on to Blunder so he can explain what bottle dome was all about. So to get you up to speed on this television show before we look at the segments that aired on TV, here's Rebel Light. Hey Ryan, thanks for bringing me on to the channel today. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm really freaking hyped to be here. And everyone watching the video, I just want to say thank you ahead of time, not only for checking my section out, but also watching the video. It's genuinely crazy and blowing my mind that I'm here right now. I've been a big fan of the channel since like for a couple years now, so just having the opportunity to jump on today and talk about a topic is literally blowing my mind. Uh, but I'm done jerking the channel off for now. Let's go ahead and talk some Battle Dome. Battle Dome began airing in the US on September 18th, 1999, and would air Monday nights on UPN. A fun fact both this and SmackDown appeared on UPN at the exact same time both shows were running. I'll do my best to stream on this here so we can get y'all back to Ryan, but there is some interesting information on the show. Unfortunately, there isn't as much on Battle Dome as you'd think that there would be. Ryan was correct to say Battle Dome was like the American Gladiators TV show. Bob Levy, who was responsible for directing the the 1991 to 1993's Gladiators also directed Battle Dome. Both shows also contain the man who was most likely created in a laboratory by Vince McMahon himself, Michael O'Hearn. More on him a bit later though. Now, aside from general aesthetics, you know, like the look of the show and the name Gladiators being changed to Warriors, the biggest difference between the two shows was that American Gladiators challenges had a more like, more or less gimmicky feel to them, while Battle Domes was more full contact. I say that somewhat loosely because despite the fact the Warriors were able to really kick the crap out of some of the contestants, they were still constrained to some very weird gimmicky events. Of the 22 episodes present in season 2, a total of 104 games were played. This includes episode 21 for the Women's Championship, but does not include the final battles because those would never contain any Warriors and featured the contestants going head to head for the final prize. Speaking of the Warriors, let's run through the 13 Warriors present in season 2, and while I do, I'm going to let you know how many games each Warrior played throughout the show. First off, the Jobbers. <laughs> Taking the lowest spot, we have Commander with a godly one game played in Season 2. Jake Fury with two, who at the time of me recording this, I actually did think that he had the lowest because I legit forgot Commander existed. Then we have Wish.com Brock Lesnar Moose with five. Finally, Prince and Baby Blue at six. Next, we got our mid-card guys, starting with Mad Dog at nine, Johnny Rocco at 11. Which, in my opinion, out of all the warriors on the show, this guy had the least amount of personality. Even linking up with three beautiful women, he's still the most boring warrior out of the entire bunch. Next up, we have Vince McMahon's Wet Dream Odell at 12. And rounding out the mid-card, we have Snake at 13. 
we now arrive at the main adventures. The dudes who give you the most bang for your money, or the ones at the very least I hope got paid for each event they played. We start off with this dirty old asshole named DOA, and no, unfortunately he's not Chains or any of the other DOA members from WWE. But he did play a total of 16 games. Next up, we get T-Money at 19, Kuda at 21, and probably the most unlikable dude on this show, we have Bubba King at a whopping 22 different events played. Personally, I didn't really like the guy, but if you look at him as sort of a heel, which isn't exactly how they portray him on the show, like if you watch it back, he's constantly running to the crowd, high-fiving people and giving hugs, but if you were to take a step back and look at him as a heel, I'm yeah, I'm stretching a bit, but you know, it kind of works. Love him or hate him, Bubba King is probably the most recognizable warrior from the show. Next to Bubba, the most obvious of the most like personality-driven warriors on the show would be T-Money played by Terry Crews. And to me, out of all the warriors here, he's the one with the only real personality on the show. I don't know, everyone else just kind of screams or stares off into the distance whenever they come out to the Battle Dome or competing in any of the events. Even Michael Hearns Odell, who they paint in the very first episode as like this really, really big deal warrior as he, you know, slowly descends from his little star like crescent looking thing all right he's painted like this really big deal but to me he just comes off really plain vanilla and just super generic uh you can tell they were banking off his look and previous experience in american gladiators i've seen a couple interviews with michael hearn and despite the fact that he comes off as a really nice guy uh, when you watch this show back and see some of the promos, you can kind of see why Terry Crews is the only notable person to come out of this entire series. Quick side note, the only reason Bubba King got 22 games was because Odell was hurt in episode 1 and needed a substitute for aerial kickboxing. And Let's run through the events real quick as well, and again, I'll let you know which ones were played the most and by who. Starting with the lowest, we have a tie. Battle Wall only being played four times in the show, and right away we have a three-way tie between Moose, Prince, and the dirty ol' asshole himself after competing twice each. The other event tied for the lowest amount of usage would be Battle Bridge, with T-Money competing twice and taking the top spot. Next up, we have Roller Cage, used eight times with T-Money and the dirty ol' asshole tied for first competing twice in the event. We then move on to Battlefield, being used 13 times, and again, T-Money takes the top spot competing five five times in the event. We then get to the staples of the show, Battle Wheel, which was used 16 times with Kuda competing in the event 14 times. It's the one he's most known for playing in. Battle Hoop was used 17 times, which <laughs> colored me surprised to find out Johnny Rocco was the top dog here, competing five times in the event. Now, I'm not trying to be an asshole with this, but this guy left such a little impression with his personality, I forgot entirely that he competed in these events. Next up, we have Takedown, which was used 20 times, with Snake competing nine of the times. And finally, we get to Aerial Kickboxing, that was used every single episode of Season 2, so 22 times, with Bubba King competing 21 times times only missing out during the women's championship episode. I'm serious, they freaking loved this challenge, and for me, I don't know, after about the third or fourth time, I just kind of got tired of seeing it, and I knew it was going to come up every time. When I was like making my notes, every time <laughs> freaking aerial kickboxing would pop up, I'd be like, oh, aerial kickboxing, Bubba King again. And I imagine uh, at the time watching the actual show, it probably was way more hype, but uh, today in 2022, it's just... It gets really old really fast. During Battle Dome Season 2, there was only ever two tiebreaker matches. This occurred on Episode 13 and the season finale with the challenge Body Slam. Basically, they stuck two contestants on two pans and swung them at each other. I see why this wasn't used very often, because the one dude in Episode 13 completely busts his chin wide open, like basically at the very beginning of the event. Then hilariously in the season finale, dude here loses his grip right at the beginning, but you know, he, he takes it well. When we move on to the final challenges, they all were basically the same thing, with the exception of episode 18, where they had all three contestants on that episode beating the shit out of each other because of the tiebreaker. Uh, usually the final challenge consisted of the two contestants with the highest points beating the crap out of each other, attempting to knock the other one off the platform. While this is a really cool visual, can we just appreciate how freaking dangerous this is? Sure, they took out wrestling slash takedowns in season two, but that doesn't stop these dudes from taking the scary bump in the very first episode of the season. And I know they have helmets and pads on, but that's not gonna help stop from breaking your freaking neck. Still, cool idea, but man, there is no way in hell this would get made today. Do you wanna know the kicker with all this? Wikipedia didn't have any of these stats laid out for me, so I legit had to go through and tally all of this myself. 
Thanks, Wikipedia. <laughs> All joking aside, there is actually an issue on the Wikipedia page itself that I wanted to address. Uh, the page says Battledome Season 1 and 2 are available to watch on iTunes and Amazon, and I confirm that that's just not true. While Season 2 is absolutely viewable to buy on Prime, Season 1 isn't streaming anywhere in the US. Thankfully, it's not that important though when pertaining to this particular video. So after going through all of that, you're probably wondering the same thing I did. What the hell does any of that have to do with WCW? Honestly, not much, but there is a couple of connections here and there. If we're talking specifically just the show before it gets to the WCW bit in season one, the contestants would all fight for the Battle Dome belt, allegedly. Again, I don't have season one, so I can't confirm. And here's the thing, if you started watching Battle Dome during season two, you would have no idea that this was even like a concept or a thing in the show. Because aside from the WCW stuff, which Ryan's gonna get to in just a bit, they have like never bring the belts up aside from maybe a handful of times throughout this entire season. Most notably, uh, aside from just random shots on the bike, are before the final challenge in episode 11. It's just kind of there. I don't know if this was an attempt to remind viewers that, oh yeah, we have a belt for the WCW crossover or what, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely there. In episode 12, they have a zoom in shot again right before the final challenge talking about the Battle Dome belt and how the contestants are going to fight for it, but uh, again, they, they don't get it. They don't even mention the belt again after the final challenge. They instead get a ring and a a chance to win a chopper in the Battle Dome season finale, making the belt a prop slash status symbol, I guess more than anything. <laughs> the icing on the cake though is the season finale. After a grueling match between the two competitors, contestant Philip Miller wins and gets his bike, his prize. He's ecstatic, and just watch how they give him this illustrious Battle Dome world title belt. This would make anybody cry with just the amount of love, attention, and just excitement he feels. The belt coveted by Millions, the ultimate prize that Philip Miller has finally won. And here's this beautiful Battle Dome belt that's yours now, too. Thank you. Yep, neither one of them give a shit. So that was Battle Dome in a nutshell, and I'm going to kick it back over to Ryan for the WCW crossover event. So we're now caught up on Battle Dome, and we understand what's going on here. You've got an idea of what the show was all about, and you're probably thinking the same thing I'm thinking. WCW doing any kind of business with a show like this in the fall of 2000 was never going to get good results. It's another bad idea. Get this though, get this. I've watched every episode of Battle Dome that featured WCW guys, and every WCW show that featured the Battle Dome guys, and certain things were aired in in the complete wrong order. Because Battle Dome shows were taped so far in advance, it's clear that whoever was putting these shows together on both sides did not take the time to put things in chronological order, and what ended up getting shown on Battle Dome did not line up with what was being shown on Nitro. It's a complete fucking mess. So what I've done for this video is realigned every segment in order to show you how this angle was supposed to play out on TV. If you just watched Nitro back then, it wouldn't have mattered. Likewise, if you just watched Battle Dome, it wouldn't have mattered either. But if you were into both shows and you were trying to follow along week by week, you'd be so confused that you'd just give up. So to the best of my knowledge and using common sense, here's the Battle Dome angle as it played out across two separate TV channels and two separate TV shows. Okay, so again, keep in mind, I've put everything in the order that I believe this mess was supposed to air on TV. If you're going to hunt down the Battle Dome episodes and Nitro episodes and watch them as they aired, you're going to get completely confused, so do keep that in mind if, for some insane reason, you want to go back and watch this stuff yourself. For example, the WCW guys show up in Season 2, Episode 3 of Battle Dome. They don't show up again until Episode 13, so that's 10 weeks in between appearances, yet over on Nitro, the Battle Dome appearances don't last longer than 4 weeks, so please just keep that in mind. WCW wrestlers showed up on the Battle Dome show and they took over the commentary desk. I believe this is the first WCW appearance because Ernest Miller introduces Team WCW for those watching at home who may not know who they are. We have Ernest Miller, Rick Steiner, Buff Bagwell and Diamond Dallas Page. Battle Dome Warriors Kuda and Michael O'Dell have just finished up a game of Battle Wheel and they, along with the Battle Dome announcers, are shocked to see WCW invaders trying to take over their show. Ernest Miller 
Connor says he'd kick Kuda's voodoo head off, and Buff Bagwell says World Championship Wrestling is number one. The Bottle Dome referee tells the WCW guys to shut up because there's a game that needs played in the Bottle Dome arena, so the WCW guys stay and they call the action. Basically, they put themselves over, they make fun of the Bottle Dome warriors and the contestants, and the real kick in the balls here is the fact that the usual commentators still talk over the WCW guys so you hardly hear a thing they have to say. Once the game ends, Kuda and Odell chase the WCW guys away. T Money comes out and he's angry that the commentators allow WCW to take over their headsets so easily. So T Money has a question, an important question. What night is Nitro on? <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? T Money needs to know what night Monday Nitro's on because he promises to show up on the next episode to get a little payback. We go to some backstage footage where the WCW guys run to their limousine while Battle Dome Warriors and other Battle Dome staff give chase. Odell cuts a promo afterwards saying it's funny how WCW ran away as the Warriors approached them, and later on T-Money says the WCW guys are fake, fake ass punks, and T-Money can't wait to show up on Nitro. So on what was supposed to be the Nitro following this episode of Battle Dome, the Warriors are seen sitting front row and they heckle WCW superstars during the first part of the show. DDP then comes out to cut a promo, and when he gets finished he notices Odell, T-Money, Kuda, Bubba King and DOA sitting at ringside. Paige says, oh look it's the Battle Dome boys, where did these jocked up monkeys come from? Dallas says, these boys are trying to make a name for themselves by appearing on a higher rated show. But Dallas has a surprise for the Warriors. Out comes Ernest Miller, Bagwell and Rick Steiner. The cat says he's fixing to say something that'll make all five of these guys jump the guardrail and Miller will happily slap each and every one of these wannabe chumps. Buff Bagwell calls the group the Bottle Dome Queers and Rick Steiner says if these guys want some, come get some. The Warriors try to jump the guardrail but they are held back by security. Bagwell continues to throw unsavory insults at the Bottle Domers as the five try their best to get in the ring, but they are held back. So looks like you gotta tune in to Bottle Dome next week to see what happens next, only you don't because the tapings were so out of order that you'd see absolutely nothing. But let's continue putting the pieces together and see what was supposed to come next. The WCW boys would retaliate by showing up on another episode of Battle Dome. Bubba King got done with a round of aerial kickboxing and he went straight after Diamond Dallas Page, calling him old and calling him fake. I should bring this up too, the Battle Dome warriors, the commentators and practically everyone who spoke on the show would try to drill in the fact that Battle Dome was real. There was nothing scripted and nothing phony about Battle Dome and this would get used against WCW and the WCW wrestlers involved in this storyline, because you know Kuda was a real voodoo practitioner. Yeah, no doubt the games that were being played were legit but Battle Dome was seriously character driven, and hey, those characters were doing an angle with the fake WCW guys so there's that too, you know? Anyway, Bubba King calls DDP the fakest and phoniest wrestler ever and everyone knows it, seeing as Dallas is a 75 year old man and WCW still let his old wrinkled ass wrestle. After Bubba gets done with another round of aerial kickboxing, the WCW boys show up and DDP says the master of the diamond cutter looks pretty good for a 75 year old, while old Bubba King here is just a pimple on Paige's ass. Rick Steiner grabs the Battle Dome championship belt as DDP tells Bubba to shut his mouth, and Bubba says that's the same mouth that kisses DDP's wife and Dallas shouldn't forget it. Buff says that this Bubba dude ain't the stuff and the WCW wrestlers then spit on the Battle Dome belt. The other warriors then come out for a fight but once again it's broken up by security. So again there's no physicality, I just want to see some of these warriors actually try to wrestle, that would be fun. Rick Steiner steals the Battle Dome championship belt and the WCW guys leave the arena. And after the next round of aerial kickboxing Bubba says team WCW just ran off to cash in their social security checks and they don't don't belong inside the Battle Dome. The next bit of this storyline happens when Nitro travels to London, England, only it doesn't because, <laughs> let me explain. I'm not sure how this is gonna look on YouTube, but the overseas shows that WCW taped around this time period don't look too great from a quality standpoint. 
There's a bit of motion blur in the videos and there's a lack of definition throughout the entire episodes. Things look a little washed out in these London shows and the Australia shows for that matter. However, when we get to the Battledome vs WCW part of the show, the quality suddenly bumps up and it looks like any other episode of Nitro. So this was recorded in the States and they play it off like the Battledome guys actually travelled to the UK to get their belt back from Rick Steiner. T-Money says the Warriors travelled from America to England to quote, bust that ass, and Doug Dillinger's like, you won't be busting any asses round here, beat it losers. The WCW lads then show up and finally things get a little physical, but it's over just like that. Nobody gets the upper hand, nobody takes any notable bumps, it's a scuffle and it just cuts back to the arena once it's over. The next meeting between these two illustrious teams takes place in the Bottle Dome. Rick Steiner would challenge T-Money to a battle dome uh, bottle. And it's all fucked up here because when we see the WCW guys arrive in the arena they're wearing the same clothes as the last time they were on the show, but when they get to the locker room they're wearing totally different clothes. Buff Bagwell psyching Rick up, telling him he shouldn't let anyone say he's fake, Rick Steiner's all real, Rick doesn't say a word, he's totally in the zone. Bubba King takes the low road by making fun of Rick Steiner's appearance and we quickly cut over to see the WCW guys sparring, I think. King called Steiner a fake and phony little man and he's gonna get his ass handed to him later. Rick and T-Money then are gonna play Battlefield. You stick your ball in the warrior's hole while the warrior tries to guard his hole from invaders like Rick Steiner. <laughs> Sorry. T-Money says he's ready and these WCW cats just live in a dreamland with all their fake junk. It's all about money, hoes and clothes <laughs> according to Lieutenant Terry Jeffords and Rick Steiner's gonna go down tonight. T-Money comes out with all the warriors and Rick comes out with his three WCW buddies. DDP says Rick's gonna hit T-Money so many times that Big Terry will think he's surrounded and Terry says yeah we'll see about that. The battle gets underway and Rick almost instantly puts money down but he trips up when climbing the pyramid. Rick again puts money on the mat when Terry misses a punch and the referee forces a stop when money throws punches while Rick's on his knees. Steiner then says fuck this, he drops the ball and the two start throwing punches. T-Money's cronies run in to break up the fight while the WCW guys are busy with the other warriors and T-Money gets in a cheap shot while Rick can't defend himself. Rick decides to take it out on the referee and the WCW guys leave the arena. So I think it's a draw, I'm not sure. We see Team WCW backstage and DDP says it was a 4 against 20 fight out there but Rick's gonna take care of business on Nitro. Team Money should show up on Monday night because Steiner's looking for a fight and this needs to get settled inside a wrestling ring. The Battle Dome Warriors show up to Nitro once again and Doug Dillinger tries to throw him out but he has no luck. Rick Steiner comes to the ring holding the Battle Dome Championship belt he stole ages ago and Rick says he's getting a bit sick of hearing these goofs talk about how wrestlers are fake and Battle Dome's real. Rick says he walked into the Battle Dome and he took their championship belt a few weeks back and there was nothing the Warriors could do about it. So if any one of these guys want to come and get their belt back they should step into the ring with the dogface gremlin. Team Money gets gets inside the ropes and there's not much of a match here. They hit the mat pretty quickly and they roll around a bit before the other warriors jump in and Rick's now outnumbered. Steiner takes a kick to the balls and the warriors reclaim the belt. It fucking begs the question, why didn't DDP, Bagwell and Miller show up? They were absent throughout this whole thing and they let their brother get embarrassed, it didn't make any sense. The final meeting between WCW and Battle Dome then featured Rick Steiner sitting in the audience holding signs that said Fairy Dome and Battle Dome sucks while sitting in the Battle Dome arena. Rick makes fun of the Warriors and the Warriors approach Rick and this leads to Steiner threatening to smash a few skulls with his steel chair. Throughout the entire show Rick continued to heckle the Battle Dome boys and towards the end of the show Steiner walked out wearing teeth money suit and Rick says it's not T money anymore it's all Rick's money. Cruz says this ends tonight and he challenges Rick to a game of takedown with Rick on defense. Terry needs to get past Rick and hit a light switch to win the match but forget about the rules here. T money charges into Rick right at the start of the battle and that's about as good as it gets my friends. The WCW boys planned a sneak attack, it's a shame they didn't do this on Nitro and WCW get the upper hand here when they attack T money and his cronies. You could say the same thing here really, why didn't the other warriors show up to help T-Money? 
WCW laughs at the Battle Dome boys before leaving the building. The commentators say this is far, far from over, but that's a big old lie, ladies and gentlemen, because that's the end of this invasion, this cross promotion from hell, this WCW blunder that benefited absolutely nobody. I read somewhere that WCW refused to pay the Battle Dome Warriors airplane tickets, and that's why the rivalry ended. Not sure if that's true or not, and really, who cares? I can't think of anything good that came from this except maybe the novelty of Terry Crews appearing in a WCW ring, and I bet there's quite a lot of folks out there who don't know a thing about this and they never knew it happened, and that's because it was only those holding on to the bitter end who stayed tuned into WCW around this time period, plus Terry Crews wasn't really a huge recognisable name in late 2000. To be fair, the angle didn't get finished, so things could have ended up differently, but I bet there wasn't even a finish line or ending to the story written because WCW really struggled during this time period from a creative aspect. I seriously doubt that there was anything set in stone for this to somehow pay off. So that was WCW vs Battle Dome and this is Nick to close out the video. Now, there never has been a concrete reason as to why this crossover took place, at least one that I can find. Uh, but we can follow a couple of breadcrumbs. Midaja, who was at the time this show was on the air, was one of Scotty Steiner's freaks. She was also married to Michael O'Hearn during this time frame. Prior to joining WCW, she worked on Battle Dome as one of the valets in season one. Clearly, she had a very particular set of skills. Now, it was through her agent, Rich Minzer, that she met Terry Taylor, and the rest is WCW history at that point. In a relatively recent shoot interview, Mike O'Hearn stated that it was through Terry Taylor again that the crossover between Battle Dome and WCW happened. Uh, it's unclear who initiated the talks between both shows, however, Michael O'Hearn alludes to the fact that this initial run wasn't going to be the end of their crossover. In fact, he states him and other Battle Domers had started going to quote-unquote camp, which I would assume was the power plant at the time. Unfortunately, it was only a couple months later that Vince McMahon would purchase WCW and the Battle Dome crossover would end. It turns out the McMahons were also scouting O'Hearn back in the early 90s for a potential WWF run, but because of his contract with the American Gladiators TV show, it just never happened. And O'Hearn alludes that it was because of this first attempt and not going through with his original plans to join the WWF that he wasn't carried over when the WCW buyout happened. I'm sure there's more to it than that, but that's the reasoning that O'Hearn had alluded to. I did also read somewhere that there was a potential Scott Steiner connection that he might have had a hand in making this whole crossover happen, but as far as I could tell, there was no evidence to suggest that. I could be completely wrong there or just missed out on something entirely, but I think what might be happening if there was no connection with Scott Steiner is people were just assuming there was a connection because of the whole Midaja connection and her being part of Scott Steiner's freaks. But that was the Battle Dome crossover. Again, I want to say thank you to Ryan for bringing me on the channel today, but I also want to thank you guys for watching this whole video through and hopefully enjoying it. I don't think I need to say this, but like you guys, I'm always eagerly anticipating the next Reliving the War, the next Blunder, and I'm also very saddened for the fact that someday it's all going to come to an end, you know, when we get to the actual invasion storyline and everything, but I'll say this, it's been a hell of a ride so far. The only question I have left is to what heights will Steve Blackman climb in his Reliving the War journey? because we all know exactly what blunders Glacier will eventually come to. And I'm also kind of curious as when the hell he's supposed to come back. I guess I could look that up, but uh, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Anyway, if you guys want to check any of my stuff out, my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash C slash R-E-B-L-L. Uh, if you want to check me out on Twitter, it's just at Light Rebel, uh, capital L, capital R. And I should pop up pretty easily on Twitter. I'm Rev of the Light Variety. If you want to see Ryan and I collab on something else, we actually took a look at the Buff Bagwell movie quite a few months back on my channel. And uh, <laughs> without spoiling anything, it was pretty hilarious. Again, thank you, Ryan, for bringing me on the channel today. And thank you all for watching.